Two more, two more studies in Hebrews, and we'll be finished with Hebrews. I have no idea how gratified I am that, I'm, that the Lord has arranged that I'm in this text for these next couple of weeks. Uh, because, because the book of Hebrews, whether you, whether you know it about or not, the book of Hebrews is about embracing God's new and better future for his people. Right? And we are, we're doing it. New Life City, you and I, are, we're embracing God's new and better future for us as, as a people of God. So um, as we go in our studies, I'm going to review you. Last week we did receiving an unshakable kingdom. And I will confess to you that I drove away from here with my bride. Yes, last Sunday morning, I looked at her. And I just said, I can't preach the kingdom of God any better than that. (laughs) I gave them everything I know, everything I've ever known. But it was his kingdom I was preaching to you. It was God's good kingdom that I'm preaching to you. And guess what? We're going to continue it today. Because he continued it in that text. That text is going on. This text is an extension of that text. So just to remind you of the context, I'm going to read it to you again. Here it is, Hebrews 12. He said, you haven't come to to Sinai. You have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God. The heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable, uh, to innumerable angels in festal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Are you kidding me? Somebody wrote that 2,000 years ago? Saying to people who came out of old covenant Israel, telling them what they'd come into, and they're trying to get it. See to the, that you do not refuse him who is speaking. New Life City, see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking this morning. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth. Now he has promised yet once more. Will I shake not only the earth, but also the heavens? And I keep reminding you, because when you see this little key, you'll get it. Heaven and earth is where the, is where the presence of God is. It was the temple. It is the body of Christ. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, the things that have been made. The destruction of of the temple that was under God's judgment and the city. In order that things that cannot be shaken, the body of Christ might remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So I don't know what's happened to you, but what is happening to you, but that's what's happening to you. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Are you kidding me? And you guys know that my beloved Papa Jack was obsessed with this idea, obsessed with this text. And somebody, who was it, Gail? Allison. Are you kidding me? Sent Gail late last night a video of Papa Jack, Gail and myself standing in front of the church and Papa Jack prophesying this text over us. (laughs) Are you kidding me? And he said, and for our God is a consuming fire. And this fire, this consuming fire 
is the consuming fire of his presence that fills all things. Fills all things. It's not, listen, this is not just for, <laughs> this is not a confined fire. This is a fire of God that, that, is, that is destined to sweep heaven and earth. All the earth and all of the heavens. All right, so that was all last week. We looked at the unshakable kingdom. This week, we're going to look at the unchanging person. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, forever. We always lift these things out of context. The writer of Hebrews is speaking to a group of people who are leaving their yesterday, who are hearing his voice today, and who are wondering if they're okay in the forever. And he's saying to them that as he has been saying through chapter 11 and through chapter 12, though they did not know him, he was in the midst of them, Jesus. Hidden, concealed in the sacrifices, in the altar, in the temple, in the, in the priesthood. In the kingdom, the throne, everywhere. He was everywhere because it's Christ in all, over all, through all, filling all things. The one for whom all things were created. And so the writer is saying to him, because listen, I'm telling you, he's putting them in a disturbance, not he, but the Lord himself. And the Lord puts you in a disturbance. You better have an anchor. You better have something that holds. He's already told them earlier in Hebrews, they're anchored in the Holy of Holies. An, a sure anchor for our soul. And it's just, whole, all this stuff is just coming to a glorious climax. I'll tell you of all the things I'll miss most. I'll miss the discipline of coming to the same group of people every week with a sure word of God and saying, you think you've heard it all yet? You ain't heard nothing yet. But I will tell you that God has led us to one who is able Hallelujah. What a great day. We're so excited about receiving you guys. <laughs> Whew, but I want you to know that while you're going through the change, ah! how many of you know it's the spin cycle of the washing machine? <laughs> right? <laughs> what was it? <laughs> and so, and so, uh, when when, <laughs> when Katie, our Adula, comes and says, "You're in transition," and then she starts describing to me what transition is because men don't know. <laughs> I'm like, "How do I get out?" <laughs> Because I don't like it. <laughs> Y'all like it? I don't like it. I don't like it. But this is it. But we have, we have an unshakable kingdom and an unchanging person taking us through, just like he's taking them through. So let's get hold of it. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 through 16 we'll go through to. Now look, because what happens, and this always confuses people. All of a sudden, he breaks into some practical, just some practical teaching. Because he's a pastor. Because he's told them, you haven't come to Sinai, you've come to Zion. Well, if we're at Zion, what happens to Sinai? What do we do? Coming to Zion from Sinai does not mean that, that Sinai is, everything is gone. It means you take that which was unshakable and bring it forward into the new, which was let brotherly love continue. Why? Because the whole thing, listen, if you're going to be established in a covenant with God, it's a love covenant. It's a love covenant. It's always been a love covenant. We leave the Sinai, but the love goes on. Deuteronomy 6, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. 
And then of all places, listen, in Leviticus for crying out loud, you find the second half of that. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And I am so pleased that God is reteaching the love lessons in my life and in some of your lives as we go through this process. Listen, if ever there's a time we got to get our brotherly love back on, it's after COVID-19. You know, those who don't wear a mask, let them kiss those who do wear a mask, but not with touch. Those who wear a mask, let them touch them who don't wear a mask, but not with touch. Beloved, let us love one another. Let love continue. I'm at a mighty crossroads, and it's one of the reasons why um, I kept my powder dry on some of the stuff for Garrett and Christina. kept my powder dry a little bit. Um, Crossroads matter. God will speak to you at crossroads. I mean, I'm in, a, I'm, in a, I'm in a crossroads just like you are. It was, um, it was the year 2000, and it was this week. I had had my life changed in 1997 in Colorado Springs at New Life Church where Ted Haggard was the pastor. So when the year 2000 came, I, I contacted Ted said, any way we can get an audience with you. Of course, I had to go through three layers of contact. But he said, yeah, absolutely. And he gave us a date upon which he would meet with us. This is your story, church. This is your story. This is how you were conceived. Ted met with us. He said, let's have an appointment on May the 25th. I'm like, are you kidding me? That's my anniversary. I didn't tell him, but you know, that's my. So I could tell, I could t- say to the church, Gail and I are going away on a little honeymoon. At that time, it was our 26th. This week, it'll be our 47th. <laughs> Sat down with Ted. I said, Ted, I've been reading your book. Your book talks about manners in the kingdom. Manners in the kingdom. And you said in your book, if you are in a church and you leave that church to start another church, you should move at least an hour away. And when I, and I believed it, I thought it was, his book, this book was called The Life-Giving Church, and I thought that's a kingdom principle. That's a great principle. Don't put a scar on the body of Christ. And so I met with Ted, though, because I said, this is what your book says, and this is what's happened to me. And I told him about how I got filled with Holy Spirit in his church and how my life had changed over three years and my wife's life had changed. And now we were probably not Baptist anymore. (laughs) Y'all know what I'm saying? And we knew, we knew we had to go forth from where we were. Even as today, I know I have to go forth from where I am. And, and I said, Ted, your book says this. And then I did, the, I did the thing that every person who wants to do something that they shouldn't do does. I said, is there any exception to this rule? And, and Ted being a, a, like a really great man and a good thinker, he said, well, it's not in the Bible, Alan. Of course there's an exception. I'm like, lay it on me, buddy. I need this exception. He said, here's what you do, Alan. You go to your church. You tell them everything God's done. You tell them about the deliverance. You tell them about the prophecy. You tell them about the tongues. You tell them everything. And then whatever they tell you to do, that's what you do. I'm going to be like, have you ever met a Baptist? (laughs) You came from the devil and you can go back to the devil. (laughs) 
She won't let me be naughty even now. You know what those people did? They loved us. They forgave us for hurting their feelings. They laid their hands on us and sent us out, Garrett. They sent us out. They gave us money and sent us out. They said, go do what the Lord's put in your heart. And then they said, if anybody wants to go with them, go with them. And it was a Sunday night in July. We had the, we had the meeting in May the 25th and it, was, and it was July the 23rd. When they, they, they had a, a service where they sent us out and, and Reba Harden stood up in that service and, and said, Pastor, there's one more thing. We blessed you. Will you bless us? Are you kidding me? I'm like, you bet I will. You bet I will. And I didn't know how, but I did it. Because at that time, I'm just like learning how to be a father who blesses his children. Next week, the whole service is a blessing. Just get ready. I'm going to bless you next week. Hopefully, some of you will get blessed today on accident. (laughs) And this church was born. And two churches across town, rather than cursing one another, blessing one another. And that became the pattern through which Charlie went out from among us last fall. Same pattern. Same pattern. Leaving Sinai, but the love continues. Keep your love on. So he's telling them, he said, he says, listen, we're going to a new covenant, but in the new covenant, the things that are in the old are here just better. So love increases. Now it's love your enemy. Now it's love, now it's bless those who curse you. Now it's, now it's a, a further extended love. Oh, that the church... I tell you, God is going to burn in his church with a consuming fire until a generation arises that knows how to love their enemies. That knows how to forgive with a lavishness that is supernatural and strange. Love continues. Do not neglect to show hospitality to, to strangers for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. You know what he's doing? He's taking them right back into their story. They said, well, what do we do now? We left Zion or Sinai. We've come to Zion. What do we do? He says, entertain strangers. Why? Who entertained the strangers? It was no less than Abraham who entertained the strangers. And in the presence of the strangers was actually having a visit from God himself and from holy angels. So he says, don't neglect entertaining entertaining strangers. So here's what I'm gonna say to you. God has a setup for you in your life. He's gonna put people in your life. They may not be supernatural creatures, but they will bear messages on their tongues. And if you miss them, you're missing holy and divine appointments. They're everywhere for you. God has appointments everywhere for you where you can listen to the voice of a stranger where you're not obeying the voice of a liar, but you're listening for God in the voice of a stranger. Even as Abraham did it, and even as you see it manifested twice in a row in Genesis 18 and in Genesis 19. Hallelujah. I'm getting fat because I'm losing my breath. It's one of the things in my future, I gotta lose weight again. Anyway, whatever. They tell me all the time, Alan, you're blowing into the microphone. Well, hallelujah. (laughs) Remember those in prison as though you're in prison with them and those who are mistreated since you're also in the body. By the way, he's literally talking about their own number in Hebrews 10. Recall the former days when after you enlightened, that is, when after you found Jesus, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction and sometimes being partners with those who were so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and abiding one. 
See, what people forget in the history, in the, in the context of Scripture, the first persecutors of the followers of Jesus were the people who were in the last covenant. They were actually the Jews. And so he's speaking to a group of Hebrews, and here are some people, some of them, some of them are in prison. This business of being in prison, it was a real thing. Remember those in prison. Now, here's what I'm saying to you. What he's doing, he's taking all of the old that they already have. He says, it doesn't go away. There are things that go away. Temple's going away. The priesthood's going away. Sacrifices are going away. There's some things that are going away because we have what we have fulfills those things. But brotherly love and hospitality and caring for those that are ostracized, it just gets heightened. My wife's one of, one of her very best friends in the world is in a prison in Houston. We met him in Huntsville, Texas, in the high security prison. And he got relocated. And he's her pen pal. They write every week. He, uh, his name is DeWitt Blunt. He has her maiden name. And uh, I know when my wife gets a letter from him, I can see the, the tears. Because she longs for him to be set free. Because he's long since paid for his crimes. Remember those who are in prison. As though you're in prison with them. Think about it. And those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. There's a lot of people that I'm fussed with because I don't understand them and they don't understand me. You want the definition of compassion, that's it. That's the definition of compassion right there. Let marriage be held in honor among all. And let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. If there's anything over which the world has rejected God, it's this. And this is a moment where This is a moment where feeling for people is not a foundation for throwing away the revelation of God, the truth of God, and the sacredness of what he has given us. Our God is a consuming fire. We live in a culture that is consumed with the fire of passion. And in its being consumed with the fire of, pa of, of passion, it has said yes to every form of passion expression and it now wants us to sacralize them and we cannot because we are people that live by divine revelation. We're disciples. We didn't invent this thing. We're not teaching God how we should be. We're learning from God how he made us. Let marriage be held in honor. There's your culture of honor. Honor the one you're married to. I'll do it one more time. Sometimes I make y'all crazy because I talk about my wife all the time. I spent my morning having coffee with a man, Paul Ford, whom I've known for 20 years, who I love. And the thing that I remember about him was he's one of those men that rem that. that Reminds me of myself because he's always talking about his wife to the point of annoying. And Julie died. And I was at her funeral yesterday. We had coffee with him this morning. Let marriage be held in honor and let the marriage bed be undefiled. You know what that means? 
It's walled off. You can't come in. This is sacred space. It's exclusive. It's binary. It's holy. It's given by God. And the writer of Hebrews is telling them how to live, and now I'm telling us how to live. It needs its own sermon, but there's not time. I've said this before, but it won't bears one more time. Every book of the New Testament tells Christians that there's two things God won't tolerate. Idolatry and immorality. Those two things he will judge. And it says it. We have cre- we've gotten so we've gotten so we've come to the place where we've created a God that we can tolerate. People all the time will tell me about their designer God. My God. <laughs> I'm like, where did you get this God? How did you fashion this idol? And so when I read the Bible, there's things I don't understand. There's things I come to and I go, oh, I don't know what that is. And and long ago I learned there needs to be an adjustment in me. Not him. And just because I don't know the answer doesn't mean there isn't an answer. Just because I don't like the answer doesn't mean it's wrong. Can we talk? For God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. Now, here's what's interesting. You see... There are people that would, they would not only, they would say all, they would tell all the things that would be wrong with leaving Sinai. And one of them is that you will lose your morality. And the writer of Hebrews says, no, we're doubling down there. We're not going to. So again, whenever somebody's going through changes, they're like, you're taking everything away from us. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, no, we're not taking anything away from you. Well, except sacrifice and temple and Levitical priesthood. and But guess what we're doing in those places? What we're giving you is superior, is greater. But many of the things they had are to be kept and cherished. Okay, everybody all right? Okay, that's the introduction. I had to say that one more time. Let me go on. He already, I gave you that verse last week. It's a doubling down on that. Hebrews 13, carrying on. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. For he has said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Okay. Okay. Met Jesus in 1972, read the book of Philippians. Never forget when I came to that incomparable place in the, in the book where it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That was the verse of scripture that actually God used to save me. If you go back and look at the context, it's actually about being free from the love of money. Because when it says, well, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, it means I can, I can economically survive. It means I can adjust me inside. I can adjust in here so that I can live out here. It literally means that. It's a good word for me to get at a moment when I'm walking away. So listen to me when I tell you, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He has been with me all these years and he has not left me now. He will be with us and he will carry us. When I read those words as a young man, I was like, oh, that's how come I can give. Giving's easy. I can give to a God that's like that. If that's who I'm with, I'm, I'm on the right team. I can, I can give. I'm safe. I'll be fine. So, see, he's giving them, he's, he's telling them who they are, who they are. This is a really big deal because in leaving the covenant of Sinai, 
Many of them, do you remember when you read it? They gladly suffered the plundering of their possessions. I wonder if the day will come when, wow. Do you realize that a lot of our political passion is over the fear of the plundering of our possessions? I know you. I know you. You know me. We complain together. He's with us. He provides for us. He's taking care of us. He's going to take care of us. I'll just give you this much of a word. There's nobody that's ever coming in this world that hadn't gotten out. <laughs> Can we talk? <laughs> You can't, even, you can't even use the usual escape valves for that, to, that statement. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Well, that's a little self-serving this morning. But don't forget us. Consider the outcome of their way of life. And imitate their faith. I knew the day when I started reading my Bible and I read about disciples, discipleship, and I read about Paul saying to people, imitate me as I imitate Christ. I knew when we had a, a teacher who would say to us, you can imitate my way of life. I knew when I read that, I said, okay, we're going to be, we can follow this guy. You're next. These guys are going to imitate you. And you're going to be safe in doing it. Hallelujah. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Hmm. Okay, so all of that I've just preached to you is the context, and this is the text. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday in Sinai, today in transition, forever in the heavenly city of God. Have you got it? He was there. He's here, he's yonder. Everywhere we go, he's already been. Everywhere we go, he made it. Everywhere we go, he is and was and is to come. Everywhere we go, it's Jesus, 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 Jesus. And so the writer of Hebrews could say that, that Moses chose to suffer reproach with Jesus. Because he was always there, concealed. He's here, revealed. He's there, fulfilled in every way. We're going unto Jesus, the same yesterday, today, forever. And then he says, don't be led away with diverse and strange teachings. And you go, well, what was that? I'm fixing to blow your mind. It was some of their Jewish traditions. How do you know that? For it's good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, which have not benefited those devoted to them. Whoop. In other words, he said, what he's always said, food doesn't make you holy. Grace makes you holy. In other words, there's always people who think God will like me if I eat the right thing. You know, if I really wanted to, I could work this text. You know, this is where I, this is where I say you'll live longer if you eat ice cream, or if you don't eat ice cream, but what would be the point? 
This is where this is where I say, eat the fat and drink the sweet, for the joy of the Lord is my strength. <laughs> this is where I say, pass the pork, all of you kosher folks. Give it here. Hallelujah. I blessed it. It's safe. I can eat it. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Can't get this stuff just anywhere. No, he's literally, listen, what, he's dragging them away from their traditions. Jesus did it. Jesus said it in Mark 7. Don't you know it's not what goes into a man that makes him holy? It's what comes out of him. What? Have you read Galatians 2 and the fighting over eating with the Gentiles? Listen, this was real conflict they were having. I know, listen, it happens to me all the time. I know every, time, every once in a while I'll meet somebody who all of a sudden discovered they have to eat kosher. And they're like, it's like I'm like, eat all the kosher you want. Pass the ham. I eat bacon wrapped kosher. I know. Listen, if I'm offending you, you need to get over yourself. I'm just sorry. You do. You do. Because listen, you understand. You, you, people, these people, he said, we're, leave, we're, we're leaving, we're leaving Sinai. I don't know if we can eat at this table. The greatest test of the early church was table fellowship with Gentiles. They couldn't eat with the Gentiles. The surest sign that God was in their midst was that they could eat with the Gentiles. Of course, since I'm sitting with a bunch of Gentiles, hallelujah. Oh, I'm about to get cheeky, but I don't need to. <laughs> Do not be led away by strange teachings. Go back, Alan. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. Now listen to what he says. This is mind-blowing. We have an altar from which those who serve at the tent have no right to eat. You understand who served at the tent, right? Right? The old priesthood. We have an altar. And then he, look how he messes with it. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy of places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. Now here's what he's doing. He's telling it was always this way for some of you because on the day of atonement there was a sacrifice and you didn't eat that sacrifice. You sacrificed it. You took it outside the camp and you burned it with fire until it was consumed. And he says, we, meaning those of us who have come to Mount Zion, have an altar. You need to prepare yourselves for communion. They're going to stand, and if you don't have the elements, raise your hand. They'll bring them to you. Communion is when we, is when we eat. We have an altar from which those who serve at the tent have no right to eat. But you and I, we're going to eat. Why? Follow the text as it goes on. So Jesus suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify a people with his own blood. What a text. What a text. What this writer is doing, it's, it explodes my mind as I think of it now. He takes the imagery of Sinai. He takes the imagery of of. Uh, of Mount, of Mount Moriah. He takes the imagery of the sacrifice and of the temple. 
And he reminds them. Anthony, take that because I, I have it. He reminds them that, that there was a sacrifice. One was taken outside the city. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. He's speaking to a group of people who are going outside the gate. Following Jesus meant embracing exclusion. It meant embracing being cast out. It meant going outside with him where he suffered. For Jesus is the sacrifice that suffered outside the city gate. And it says, in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. So if you have come to Zion, you've been sanctified by the blood of Jesus. Therefore, let us go outside the camp and bear the reproach that he endured. Hallelujah. Wow. Every time I come to the table of the Lord now, I'm overwhelmed because I know what it is we're doing. All the time, people get a little frustrated with me because they go, this is like just a memorial, right? Let me tell you what a memorial is. A memorial is a reliving. It's reliving. When we remember Jesus, we relive the moment. You and I don't relive the moment of his death. We relive the moment in which his death was applied to our heart. And we said, I'm free. I'm forgiven. I'm washed. And so the, the body of Christ, the Bible says that he bore our sins in his body on the tree. Hey, church, the body of Christ is given for us. And this is what makes our faith a religious faith. There's a mystery in it that we can speak, but we can't explain very well. And the mystery is how that his blood sanctifies us. We're made holy by his blood. That means everywhere where we've missed the mark. Listen to me now. Everywhere we've missed the mark in our bodies, in our hospitality, in our brotherly love, in our lack of compassion. Every place where we've missed the mark, our marriage, he sanctifies us. So you are clean through the blood that he shed. This is the blood of Christ. This is the blood of the covenant. This is the blood that was shed for us. Hallelujah. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him. Now, let me press this point home. This, this is where it gets really important for us to get this. When we gave ourselves to Jesus, we, when we gave ourselves to Jesus, we put an allegiance inside of our lives that trumps every other allegiance. We put an allegiance inside our, ourselves that's beyond anything that we have. And so, and so here's what I'm saying to you. That allegiance means that those who are in the blood covenant with me with Jesus are more my family than my blood kin. Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Now, it's very hard for us to understand this. And never have we gone through a year as a nation 
where people understood this less. The political polarization that started in our country when COVID-19 hit and accelerated when George Floyd was killed and magnified through a turbulent election and then was agitated through the voices of prophets all over our country is a voice of division that has come upon us that brings us to a point that we have to ask, to whom do we belong? The writer of Hebrews, see, I can press you on this because this guy was talking to real people in a real situation. It's as simple as this. He's asking them to bear losing their citizenship. He's asking them to be cast out of the covenant with the nation that, of which they were born. He's asking them to choose the blood of Christ over the blood of their kin. It's here, folks. It's here. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp. If a Jewish person is saying you go outside the camp, you're saying go where the unclean are. Go and be counted unclean. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear his reproach. Now listen, for here we have no lasting city. But we seek a city that is to come. What is the Christian response to what happened in the last 12 months in our, in our nation? Is it to fly a BLM flag and live under the banner of the creed of BLM? It is not. Is it to fly? Is it to fly in a, fl a flag of America with our constitution and its bill of rights? It is not. The Christian answer to this is to let brotherly love continue. It is to choose one another over the political polarizations of the hour to choose one another over the divisions of this horrible hour that we've been in. It's to choose love when we have an opportunity to hate one another and reasons to do it and we can justify it because you're taking away, you're plundering our goods. I'm not letting anybody off. I'm not letting me off. I'm not letting us off. When I gave myself to Jesus, I gave myself to Jesus over against every other allegiance. For we have no lasting city. I'm sorry. The country hasn't been invented yet that is a lasting one. The country hasn't been invented yet. Oh, but it has. It's a country that exists in the midst of every nation, tongue, tribe, kindred. It's a nation of those who share one spirit, not one, not one physical blood. It's not the blood of Abraham in our veins. It's the blood of Christ that causes us to have the spirit of God in our hearts through which we are united. For there we have no lasting city. We're seeking a city that is to come. Now listen to what he says. Through him then for let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That's the fruit of our lips that acknowledge his name. What's he saying now? We're going to take our worship with us. We're going to praise him. We're going to stand and praise him. We're going to rejoice in him. We're not going to neglect to do good and to share what we have. Nothing was more important in our church in the last year than the sharing with one another, with people who were suffering loss and, 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 and coming along beside one another. But listen, a day is coming when it'll be harder and we'll be called on to do it more. But oh, don't miss this. Don't miss this. What brings us together? <laughs> Who? Who's the name I glory in? ask you what great thing I know, what delights and thrills me so. What's the high reward I win? Who's the name I glory in? Jesus Christ, the crucified. You know what that does to me? That brings me together. Black and white. Anglo. Gentile. Native. It brings us together. 
In Jesus we meet. In Jesus we unite. In the sacrifice of his blood we are one. I've been so broken over what's going on. And the, and the Lord said, why? You've been preaching what you're supposed to preach. All along. You want the secret to the hour? The secret to the hour is found. I'm sorry, it's still found in our churches. It's still found, it's still found in our churches. The secret of the hour is still found in our churches. It's, it's, still found, it's found in every church, everywhere in this nation, where people say we have one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all who is in all. We have Jesus. Through him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of the lips that acknowledge his name. Stand together with me. I'll impress you a little more before I'm done. I've been so, hallelujah. Y'all all right? You, 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 let, me, let me confess something to you. I'm like, they're all with me until I got to that last bit. Because listen, we've all been pulled. We've been pulled and polarized. But our creed is Jesus is Lord. And I might not agree with you on how that works out in the United States of America. But I want you to know that I'm not in charge. I'm riveted to Jesus. And Jesus has been so good. Let me tell you how good he is. He's been giving me kisses from heaven. So yesterday I went to one more funeral. I was just like, God, I can't please not have to go to a funeral for a while. <laughs> and it was my friend and his wife. And I'm sitting there in that funeral. This is, this is true. I'm sitting there in that funeral. And to be honest with you, I felt so much in pain. I was feeling my friend's loss and I was looking across the room and I was feeling some of the losses I've suffered in recent times. And I was feeling that old dark cloud trying to come. It was coming. It was just coming, trying to swallow me up. And so I said, I'm going to get out of here as soon as I can. He came to the end of the service and they stood up saying, how great thou art. And I said, this is my exit. Literally, I got up. I'm over here in the corner. Josh, I'm over here sitting where you are. Out that door, out I went, down the hall, and oops, I got to go to the men's room. Hit the door of the men's room, and lo and behold, the door of the men's room flashed open, and there was the man whose wife had died. My friend. He looked at me, because I'm, I'm, he's about there. He looked at me, he, grabbed, he just reached up all in one motion, grabbed my face and kissed me and went right past me back into the, <laughs> to finish the song and finish the funeral. And I went, I went, God, you won't let me run, will you? Why won't you let me, why won't you let me run? You gotta listen to me. We're serving a God who says, I'm not letting you run. And I'm not letting you divide from people that belong to you. And, this, and, and I'm like, okay, thank you, God. Can I please start crying again? And my phone rings. And it's Will Hart. And Will says to me, hey, Alan. I said, what, what is it, Will? He said, man, I've been trying to call you. He said, last night I was in church in Laguna Nigal in California, Mike Hudgens Church. And he said, 14-year-old girl was in the crowd. And I, read, I looked at her and I said, you, come here. And she came up. He said, I prophesied over her about 15 minutes. And he said, I got in the car to leave last night. And the preacher said, you know who that was? That was Alan Hawkins' granddaughter. I didn't know she was going to church. 
I knew she was in California, and I hadn't been able to be connected with her in a long time. And I have on my phone a picture. And, of course, I went scrambling to the Internet, go through the files. Let me look, let me look, let me look. And I find this moment, and he calls her up from the stage. It's two people that interrupted him two times. He's t- he sent them away. So he keep prophesying over his And I heard him say, very faintly, Lucy. He took the microphone and stuck it in his back pocket. I didn't, and as he was taking it away, I heard him say, above your wildest dreams. I'm like, that's Will. <laughs> that's Will giving the word of God. And listen, 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 listen. Jesus, one more time saying, I know you. This is your God. This is my God. This is your Savior. This is my Savior. This is our King. He knows us. And so the first time I stood in church on a Christmas weekend and looked out and saw a tall man and a shining girl. I said, wow, look at them. Who are they? Something like a year later, they came on staff at our church. And they came on staff at a time when I had made promises to them that I told them, I'm going to have to break my promises to you. And they said to me, we're coming anyway. Because we made promises to you. And God graciously let me keep my promises to them. And you certainly kept your promises to me. And you said yes to Jesus. And I bless you because you've always said yes to Jesus. And when you left, when you left to go into, into Garrett, to go into your family business, like a lot of people, I pondered for a minute. I'm like, I don't know if he'll make it. Because he said, I'm going to do this for five years and then I'm going to missions. It's five years, folks. It's five years. He said, yes. They waited. They paid a price. They gave themselves. And now, what are they doing? Now they said, okay, now we'll say yes to giving up everything we've, we've got so that we can say yes to Jesus again. You said yes to Jesus. We're saying yes to Jesus. This is a big deal in our church. This is a big day. This is a big season. God is gathering and sending, and we're saying yes. And I'm asking you to come out of the divisions of the last year and into the unity that's in Christ. I'm asking you, because I'm going to tell you something else God is doing. He's also saying, I'll tell you what else we're going to do. We're going to work on reconciliation too. I've always loved reconciliation until I have to do it. My wife's looking at her watch, so it's time for me to stop. Lest I need reconciliation. (laughs) Jesus is trying to kiss you this morning. The one who received the kiss of betrayal is giving us the kiss of love. He's giving us the kiss of reconciliation. If you need a kiss this morning, why don't you come forward?